I'm M. Sauter, better known as the Pints and Panels. And I'm Don Ness, better known as the Dawn of Beer. Welcome to the 30th episode of the All About Beer podcast. Every two weeks, we talk with leading experts and take a deep dive into one topic in beer. This week on the show, we're going to be talking about new lagers. What's a West Coast Pilsner? What is a juicy lager? Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer. And if you're feeling generous, visit our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. We have a thing we want to bring up. Please rate and share this podcast because it's a good podcast. Don't you think so, Don? Yeah. Uh, I may be a bit biased, but I actually think it's the best podcast. Well, there we go. So if you are biased and enjoy the program, please tell your friends about us and give us a good review on wherever you listen. Thanks so much. Hi, this is John Hall, the editor of All About Beer, and this episode of the All About Beer podcast is brought to you by Estrella Galicia, and I'm joined by Xavier Cabello from the brewery to talk about lager. It's what the brewery is really all about, lager, isn't it? Estrella Galicia is mostly about lager, but our brewers enjoy brewing different things as much as anybody else. For them to enjoy, there is a line of beers in 500 milliliter bottles called simply Fabrica de Cervezas or Beer Factory. Where we do small batches of lager or ales with very special ingredients. The first one, for example, was a lager with a typical Galicia green pepper padron, spicy and green. Another one, a Belgian double fermented with a Saccharomyces yeast selected among 90 wild yeast strains trapped in the Trappist monastery next to our town of A Coruña. An India pale lager, a milk stout, or other exotic ingredients like octopus, bay leaves, barnacles, etc. etc. On the regular brews, we also brew ales, although they cannot be found in the American market yet. A Belgian wheat beer, or a version of an Irish red that we brewed for the first time with our partners from Ireland Carlo Brewing, also known as Horas. This last one is just a Galicia adapted version of the Irish red style, with caramel malts and dry hop with Provo hop pellets. It was brewed as a one time brew in the Fabrica de Cervezas line of beers. But it was so successful that now is part of the family of four beers called 1906, with a Hellesbock, a Dunkelbock, a Doppelbock, and now an Irish Red Ale. Thank you so much for that insight and for being a sponsor of this episode. And to learn more about Estrella Galicia, please go visit estrellagalicia.com. Don, I gotta ask, how do you feel about new beer styles? Uh... I love any real artistry. So I do like new styles when they're put together with thought and somebody's trying to achieve some interesting result. Just like when chefs put together a new dish, mm. uh, I really like that. But what I don't like is, you know, I think sometimes just people are like, got to get rid of grains or something. I don't know. Uh, oh, how about you? Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, well, that's another episode for another day. <laughs> Not that I'm cynical or anything. You know? Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I and, really like new styles. Yeah, okay. Because it shows that beer never fizzles. It's always there's always an evolution. It's right. always reinventing itself and it's exciting because Well, and every beer style was new at one point, right? That's yeah. I mean, back in, you know, in the 1840s, well, we got like 1840s is like a golden age. We get Pilsner, we get uh, Mertzen, we get Vienna Lager. And I bet when those showed up, everyone was like, oh, yeah, it's, not, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not like the smoky Munich uncles. I like, burp, 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 you know, like, and now it's not sour enough. It's not, I need more smoke. I need more dark, dark malts and burned thing. I don't actually, would not, we should take it, we should invent a time traveling device and Could go back and try some of those. Uh, untapped would have been so unruly because they'd have to all write it out on parchment paper. <laughs> <laughs> oh okay all right anyway uh if you would like to help support the show uh and the all about beer podcast reach out to podcast at allaboutbeer.com malt europe malting company is based in north america specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries with local farms and malt houses spread across the united states canada and mexico malt europe malting company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at customer success at malteurope.com or dial 844 
five four six malt for questions or to place your order john harris has been involved in the craft brewing industry for 37 years in 2013 john opened ecliptic brewing in portland oregon where he is the brewmaster slash owner he started his career as a brewer at mcmenamin's hills hillsdale brew pub in 1986 he left to become the founding brewmaster at deschutes brewery in 1988 and then went on to serve as the brewmaster at full sail brewing in 1992 John was the first craft brewer member of the MBAA National Technical Committee and is the past president of the MBAA District Northwest. He served on the Oregon Brewers Guild board for many years and is a past president. John's awards are numerous. Gold medals at the World Beer Cup and the Great American Beer Festival. He also received the Brewers Association Russell Russell Shearer Award for Innovation in Brewing in 2001. After 20 years at Full Sail, John left to open Ecliptic in 2013, which is a production brewery and restaurant in Portland. Audrey Johansson grew up in Houston, Texas, before moving to Washington State to pursue a PhD in chemistry. Postgraduate school, looking for something new, she started washing kegs and pouring beer at a small brewery in Seattle. Fast forward to today, she is currently the head brewer at Ravenna Brewing Company in Seattle, Washington. Audra and John did a collaboration beer that they dubbed a Juicy Lager. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this one. Welcome yeah. to the show, John and Audra. Yeah, thanks for having me. Howdy. Thank you. All here. right. What the blank excuse uh, is a juice. So we're here to talk about your juicy lager. And I bet everyone I so I asked the Internet and I said, who makes a juicy lager? And everyone told me to go fuck myself. Um, <laughs> and I was like, wow, all right. Wow. Geez. I'm just asking a question. Um, so what is a juicy lager? Like, is this a marketing thing are you trying to kind of do like a cold ipa thing is there more to it are you trying to start a conversation what what was your thinking behind this collaboration of a juicy lager i don't know do you want me to go out there yeah you want to take the first stab at it sure sure well um first off we decided we didn't want to make an ipa (laughs) because (laughs) there's so many ipas you know in the world um but we decided to make a lager taste like an IPA. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not a cold IPA because it's not, the alcohol content isn't high enough to be a quote unquote a cold IPA. But the idea was that, you know kind of we used some some newer varieties like Enigma and Cashmere, mm. and I paired it with a newer, it's not so new but still a newer variety, Citra, and a classic um, German uh, newer German hop, Mandarina Bavaria, and all these hops kind of lead to a juicy kind of citrusy kind of flavor in the beer. So that's literally like orange juice, lemon juice, lime juice kind of thing. Hmm. So that, that's what's kind of like the a little of the backstory, I think. Um, Audra, what do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think when you first came to Ravenna, you're like, oh man, you're doing all your IPAs with lager yeast. <laughs> 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 so we kind of took it from there and uh, went a little bit different direction but yeah I mean I totally agree with what you said definitely shooting for also some like tropical fruit like some pineapple mango passion fruit um just enough bitterness I think to give it structure but still just be like juicy it kind of almost comes off as like a pale ale but is it the water yeast it's yeah. like all all that juiciness is coming from the hops as opposed to like getting some esters from you know, bring a true pale ale. I don't know. That is was it, kind of my thought yeah. behind it. Is it lagered? So if you're, I mean, you're, are you just using lager yeast so you can call it a lager? Or is there any kind of like conditioning process or we're just using lager yeast and we're going to brew it with ale timing? How's the timing work for the beer yeah, like this? And, and temperature too. Favorite yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, the, um, the beer was about a three week beer in the, in the tank. Okay. Um, so it's, a week more than our, our normal ales are. Um, the uh, we fermented. We started at fifty-seven degrees and let it rise to sixty degrees. And that's where it held for the entire, you know, finishing of the fermentation. So, so it definitely, you know, upper end for lager yeast, but that way we'd also reduce diastole, Perfect. which is pretty important. <laughs> Does it have a like IB? Like, what's the IBU? of i'm not that anyone really cares about ibu anymore but um (laughs) what uh like is it does it have because 
we are the other half of the show is we're talking about West Coast Pilsners. And what you're describing just sounds like the like juicy hate, not like the not hazy, hazy version of a West Coast Pilsner. Do you is there is there Pilsner malt being used? Do you guys use specialty malt or is it just straight pale? And then, yeah, what's the bitterness like? Well, the, the, the malt bill was split 50 50 between pale and pills malt. Okay. And that was all. Oh. No, no cutlery malts, no caramel malts, or anything like that. No. They, I heard they still make those, but you don't see them very often. Caramel malt? What's that? I don't, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that before. But um, but the um, yeah. So the idea was to keep it light uh, on, on the malt side. The bitterness is in the you know forty eight, probably to fifty IBUs at the most. Oh, um, okay. So so it has a little had a little zip to it, but the real you know for the lower gravity, you know, I mean the gravity. What was the gravity? I got it right here. Um, where is it, Ravi? There it is. Yeah, so it was, we were targeting about 12.5. We hit 12.3 on the brew. Okay. Um, okay. So it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, like you said, in the pale ale zone for if it was an ale beer. Um, so it's not an IPA in sense that you're pushing six, six and a half or something like that. It's, it's not that strong. So uh, original gravity 12.3 and then ABV was a little over five, right? Five and a half, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's super dry. Is that correct? Yeah, I finished it at two play doh. So okay. so ten oh oh eight if you're in specific gravity world. Okay. Awesome. So, you know, Audra, were there yeah, were there any beers you were trying to channel when you were and John were brewing this together? Or did you have any like flavors in mind? Um Yeah, I mean no specific beers that were on the top of my brain. We do a fair number of hoppy loggers, West Coast Pilsers, whatever you want to call them these days at Ravenna. Um, and this was definitely a little bit different direction, but we were shooting definitely for some like orange, kind of like Sunny D, tropical mm. flavors. Um, and with like a, with a two Play-Doh finishing gravity, um, as far as what we do at Ravenna, definitely like a little bit higher finishing gravity so i think that lends to the juiciness like when we're doing a hoppy lager i tend to shoot for like 1.6 play-doh so it's a lot crisper um but we were definitely going for like juicy juicy on this one so you think so that think kind of changes the like it's so it's not an ipl because I always think of these new lagers trends is it's like isn't that just a like italian pilsner or isn't that just an ipl um, when I'm teaching beer stuff, people, always, when I do the difference between IPL and cold IPA, people are like, that's the same thing. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> not. So well, how did, yeah. I don't know any IPL that was dry hopped, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean it was, back when IPL came out, there was, dry hopping was a crazy idea that a lot of people weren't doing. Mm. You know, dry hopping really didn't become, in my opinion, really prevalent until, you know, 2010, 11, 12, and there, 12, 13, in my mind, just because you used to see a lot of IPAs without any dry hop in the early, yeah. in those in the early teens. But now, of course, you, you can't get away without dry hopping. I was, yeah, people, I mean, people want to <laughs> yeah. add, they want the barrel, like barrels per, and they, yeah, people, that's kind of the new, back 10 years ago, it was, what's the IBU? And now yes. people are like, is this double dry hop? Is it triple dry hop? Which you, is, add, you added yeah. hops to the kettle? What? <laughs> Um, uh, go ahead, Don. I, oh, I just wanted to ask because I guess juicy for a lot of people has a connotation of like New England style, and I'm thinking in the IPA space. Um, and so with your juicy lager, were you are you using juicy just as a descriptive term, or are you thinking about biotransformation and thiol, which is you know super trendy in uh, in a hazy IPA these days? Well, you know, it's not hazy, so I mean, okay. I think generally it was just, I think it was just a, more of an adjective, you know, more of a descripting word for the yeah. lager, okay. you know, like the idea was to drive IPA juiciness, whether that be from a hazy or from a traditional West Coast or a traditional IPA, but just kind of driving that flavor yeah. into, into the beer. It's just juicy. Yeah, because I mean, we use this, this hop Enigma, which, you're right, you weren't, you're not a huge fan of Enigma, right, um, Audrey, or you, you felt like it can go overboard sometimes. I think I it's, I love Enigma personally. Um, I just think it could definitely overpower. Yeah. Um, and while it has like a huge tropical component to it, 
I also feel like it has just like a massive dank quality. Um, so judicious use, I would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we definitely took it light, but it was the lead hop in the dry hop, though. You know, it was the mm -hmm. one that was used more than as a ratio was higher than the cashmere or the mandarina. And the citra was really just a accent hop in the in the dry mm -hmm. hop, more just because it, it, it's a great complimentary hop citra. I think it's mm -hmm. uh, single sm smash citra beers can get either be really really good or weird, um, <laughs> in my opinion. But uh, but it's a great just complimentary hop. Um, I, be I believe our test brew we didn't have any citra in the test brew, but we decided to add some once we tasted the test brew. Was this brewed in Seattle or Portland or both? It's here in Portland. Oh, okay. What was the like? What was the reaction like from? in the tasting room where people like what the heck is this or were they really into it or how were sales were were people excited yeah it seemed like it went over pretty well in, in our, at least in our tasting room i mean the uh you know, the beer sold through and you know we're always trying to do like i said something different you know and this was something it's a different project that um uh, we had never done before uh here uh we made you know different hoppy loggers before but not mm -hmm. actually trying to drive not drive you know the lager flavor away but you know it's it's kind of hidden in there a little bit you know it's, it's a lager beer but it doesn't taste like a traditional like what might call a lager you know like audra mentioned earlier her sneakiness making her ipas with a lager yeast that you know you wouldn't even know it you know <laughs> but they make it really that's clean. What, yeah that's what uh kevin davy did when he worked at wayfinder he was our first guest ever on the show and when he mentioned he did all his west coast beers with lager yeast i'd never heard of that before is that like a more prevalent thing nowadays or is that a pacific northwest thing because you guys are always doing everything before everybody else is in my opinion um so who unsure. knows because we don't i don't generally advertise mm. <laughs> well everybody knows now well everyone yeah, yeah. Well... <laughs> we have we have dozens of listeners and they're all gonna know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean i have no problem with people knowing it's just not you know it's not on a sales sheet mm -hmm. or anything so I don't know if other breweries are doing that. Can, can I ask hard to say. why is it, is it again, is it just a sensory thing? Cause I guess I'm not a brewer, not, I'm not even a home brewer. Um, and I guess my, I thought that lager yeast was more finicky to use and takes a longer time. And, you know, so why, why do you do it? Yeah, it's definitely a sensory thing for us. Okay. Um, and we ferment quite warm for our IPAs. Uh, okay. So we're talking, we'll knock out at the lowest end, actually. But then the next day, we'll let it free rise all the way up to about 65. And it'll just finish out the entire rest of the beer at about 65 degrees. Um, yeah, I guess for me and a West Coast IPA, I enjoy less yeast character. Mm -hmm. And I just want... I just want hot flavor. So our, our malt base is super simple. The yeast character is very low, not a lot of esters going on. I think it's just a great showcase for all the cool hops that are out right now. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't take too much longer when you ferment that warm. Um, and, and it sounds like the yeast handling isn't that much more difficult. No, once you, get a handle on what strain you're using it's you know it's like any other right okay thank you for that i was yeah no just problem. curious <laughs> i mean the yeah. rest, rest in peace anchor has been brewing everything with a lager yeast forever you know their entire history pretty much was used lager well yeast that's forever. true there yeah the right? california california alias yeah that's a warm fermented mm -hmm. cast. yeah what do, you, do uh, they do liberty with that and everything too I think, I think Liberty they... might have been different yeast, but oh, okay. yeah. I, but I know. But I'm just saying that they've been they've been for many lager yeast yeah. for temperatures since the 1800s. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, not particularly a new, and but, it drives new style innovation. Yeah, so well, I mean, I mean, to them. I'm just kidding. Oh, geez. Geez, Don, <laughs> too soon. Too, I was just going to say too soon. Um, Sorry. John, I actually have a question for you because. I always feel like your brewery is always up on tr good, tr like new trends. Like your, I was there, oh God, 2018 and you were big in brewed IPAs. Um, so I feel like you're a really good person to ask this. Like, do you, where do you think the beer, cause you're making a juicy lager now. 
So everything's on the table. Like, where do you see beer going uh, in the next five years? Do you have a, do you have any thoughts? I bet I feel like you've got some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, the crystal ball question. I mean, yeah. I mean, Return of Caramel Malt, though. <laughs> yes. I've never heard of it, and, and I want to try it. And kettle hops. People are good at kettle hop again. No, the, um, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's interesting here because, like, all of a sudden we decided to make a West Coast Pilsner, and, and we had no one had really used that name until, you know, and then suddenly within either a couple of days before or, or a couple of days after, you know, three breweries, including us, all released a West Coast Pilsner, Pilsner in Portland. It was kind of like, oh my God. <laughs> Are we all drinking? Is it the water? You know what's going on? That <laughs> we'd all suddenly decide to make a West Coast Pilsner, which, you know, it's, you know that's what, like you said. You already talked about that earlier, but um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, I mean, for some reason, I, you know, other than the, you know, the fact that you know, as an industry right now, craft is soft in the marketplace, and I'm not sure what the next Ranger beer is going to be, but all things come around eventually. And, um, you know, we still have a red ale in our we sell in our bar just because it's we have people who still want to drink that style of beer. And I'm not saying that's coming back or not, but um I still see hops to be the driver, um myself. Um and whether that be, you know, in a lower alcohol version like this juicy lager, which kind of reminds you of the hop character of an IPA, but yet doesn't drive the alcohol of an IPA. I, mean, I think that's it seems like lower alcohol trends are probably gonna continue, I would think. Um it's really hard to say. I mean, it's, that's a yeah. It's really hard to say. No, that I mean, that's the the answer you gave. You know, and are you you're having fun still? You both having a good time brewing in the Pacific Northwest? Things are good out there. Beer's good. I mean, it's real heaven for for beer drinkers. It's fresh hop season, so it is fresh hop season. Yeah, <laughs> for better or for worse. Fresh hop juicy yes. lager. Is this a? Could this be yeah. a thing? All right, John, next year. Okay, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you heard it here first. <laughs> Fresh up, juicy lager. Um, John, I wanted to ask, you know, um, you obviously you've had a long career uh, in the industry and won awards for innovation and all of that. How do how does your history uh, uh, shape the way you think about new beers? Or do you feel that, your knowledge of of well like crystal malt used to be really popular and now it's not anymore do you think about that and do you think you think about it differently than maybe some of the young brewers who just like oh i'm gonna you know i'm gonna do this and they don't have the history of crystal malt or or whatever um yeah it's interesting because um give me a second here um like when, when i first started brewing you everything was you know the whole shtick was Right, heights come out, you know, like we're all copying this, you know, Bavarian German purity law. And we're brewing with all natural ingredients. And that was like the big call to arms that made micro brew or you want to call it craft beer. At the end of the day, it's just beer. Right. Let's just be real about it. Um, I always felt like the micro beer term was always like, hey, you're one of those micro brewers, right? I'm like, yeah, we're small. That's right. <laughs> we're micro, you know, just, just really silly. But, um, but it, it, nowadays, you know, the, that whole attachment to try to tell the story to get people to try your beer about the, you know, because at that point on you know, Miller Lite had 75 different additives in it at one point in the late seventies, early eighties. And, you know, it had stuff to foam it, make it foam, not foam, foam just the right amount and et cetera. So there's, you know, brewing, you know, like I remember an old brewmaster once saying like, yeah, we actually converted starch in the mash tun. <laughs> I'm like, and what, what do you do otherwise? Oh, we just throw enzymes in the kettle and boil it. Now we can make it faster. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. And what I find interesting now is that there's a little crop of brewers, younger brewers who are like, what is this hop extract? What is this enzyme? What is this, you know, right. genetically modified yeast? What's this? So there's a lot more like kind of, kind of the sky's the limit right now, I think, in brewing where, you know, everything's on the table. Whereas in this beginning, 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 it was such a, it's just, you know, the purity thing that I think's left. Not left, beer is still pure, but just but people's willingness to try some hot products they maybe wouldn't have tried years ago, or enzymes that you know, like would dry your beer out even more, things like that. That in the early days you wouldn't think of even thinking about using, but now it's um, pretty commonplace that people are really just you know going for it, with, and making just making a beer they want to make, and 
you know, if it, if it, you know, like the smoothie stuff, it's like, really? Okay. <laughs> you know, but go for it because it's, it's your beer and you have a right to, you know, throw out your ideas for the world and see what sticks and what happens. So I think that, yeah, it's just, you got to keep an open mind more these days, I think, because, because people are doing really creative things. And that's why I've learned at least it's, it's like, we're not, you know, beer is still being reinvented every day. So the industry is not done as far as that goes. To, you know, I think we're still being creative and, pushing boundaries and trying new things. And I think that's what makes, you know, craft beer or beer in general exciting. Right. It sounds like I you're totally, here for I it. I totally too. agree. Yeah. Awesome. Andrew, I wanted to ask about what you thought about the future of beer as someone who's, when did you get into the industry? I was just going to say, I have no history. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, <laughs> you're, my, you're here now. So you are. I'm about, uh, I've probably only been in the industry about six years. So it's been that's, that's plenty of time. So quite yeah, a short stint. So what have you I seen think... in that time? And then, like, what do you think about the future? Are you excited about it, or are you? You know, a lot of brewers. There's a lot of innovation. It can be daunting, or there's the way that beers are made. A lot of people get agitated about stuff, which I think I think it personally is silly. But I'm always open to hearing what brewers have to say. So yeah, what do you think the future of where beer is. I mean, you're brewing juicy lagers, so you're obviously, you know, excited about new styles, I would assume. Totally. Yeah. Um, having not a lot of uh, history in the industry, I have no qualms really about trying anything. That's kind of how I came into the industry. Um, as long as it appeals to me, I'm, and if I can get there, in a non-traditional way, I'm happy to do it. Um, as far as the future of beer, not a clue. Um, I kind of fly by the seat of my pants and I think I'm with the whole industry in the moment right now, which everything seems to be turning to a little bit lower ABV styles, which I love. So I was super happy when John asked if we wanted to do a juicy lager, uh, really enjoying the West Coast Pills movement. Um, big loggerhead over here so nice um i hope that continues um but yeah um i mean who knows we've in the six years i've been in the industry we've gone through quite quite the gamut of changes so <laughs> <laughs> this is true so, i wanted yeah. to say you know you 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 self-deprecatingly said you have no history in beer but i want to point out that you are making history in beer with your juicy lager so this is Absolutely. true also true yeah it sounds really i'd love to are you um i guess our last question is are you going to brew it again i don't know john i don't know i mean <laughs> maybe i don't i mean we've cycled back different beers on and off through time and you know probably would want to make it better right <laughs> or not better but you know we want to twist it somehow but it's My possible. request is that you brew it again and do the fresh hop version next year. Agree. So, yeah. yeah, we could do a small one, fresh hop version next year for sure. That would be amazing. Okay. I, I, actually, we probably have to make it in the spring because we get fresh enigma, right? Wet enigma from oh, Australia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, United from uh, Australia. Yeah. <laughs> that, yes. that doesn't sound expensive at all. No, it? yeah. <laughs> in, in fact, Can I you will... even fly from Australia in 24 hours? <laughs> I will personally I fly down there and bring the hops with me because it's such precious cargo. You don't want a courier to bring it. I will personally bring it. For Don me. will be your courier. Yes. Okay. He'll do it. That's like how, that yeah. episode of The Simpsons where Bart was a courier. Yeah, he wanted <laughs> all the Big Macs to Marlon Brando's Island. Exactly. Uh, sorry, nerd stuff. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, this was really fascinating. I like how you guys are reinventing the wheel. I mean, it's really cool to see, and I want other people to brew it. We have, I, I haven't agree. had the West Coast Pilsner trend. Has I live in New England, so I live in hazy country. We have not. Um, we have not gotten uh West Coast Pilsner yet, but I'm fingers crossed that maybe one uh maybe one day they'll make it maybe across the country, so I'll get to have some. So yeah, it sounds like you just need to book a flight. I mean, I will be in Denver next week for the Great American Beer Festival, so I'm going to keep my eyes out. And Don and I were talking about going to Yakima next year, so we'll be in very vaguely in your area, which is yeah. totally Absolutely. not in your area. But we yeah, would yeah. two or three hours from Portland or Seattle. So oh, yeah, we're out yeah. there pretty much every week at this point in the year. So <laughs> so it sounds like we got to drink some juicy lagers together next Absolutely. year. Absolutely, that sounds Wonderful. good to me. Cool. 
Um, so if people want to reach out to you or find out information about your breweries, um, Audra, what's the social media that for yourself, for the brewery, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, the brewery, we're on Instagram at Ravenna Brewing. Um, we also have a website, ravennabrewing.com. Um, you can find us there. It's probably the easiest way. Cool. And John, how can people reach out to you or find out information about your brewery? Oh, similar. I mean, it's uh, Ecliptic Brewing on you know, Instagram or Facebook and then um, an X. Don't forget X, right? Yeah, I mean, X. Yeah, whatever. Uh, whatever I wish they stopped the... writing formally oh, yeah. known as Twitter. I hate that. But anyhow, yeah. um, <laughs> and then our, you know, we have a website, too, that lists all the beers we have on tap. Like right now, we got a whole bunch of fresh hops going. That's, that's nice. most breweries in Oregon and Washington do right now. So. It would be a crime if a brewery didn't have a fresh hop beer and they're in the Pacific okay, Northwest. We, uh, we have five on right now. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> Oh Dang, you've already gone through five, John? Well, that, we're, we have five on now, yeah. A couple, pil- couple Pilsners and a IPA, Hazy IPA, and another IPA. Yeah, that sounds so, wonderful. That's a, it's a, the but, best time for beer. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yeah, awesome. and, and they start tasting different after two or three days. <laughs> so I know, that's my favorite, that's my favorite part about, yeah, drink them Drink them when you like them. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 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 Cool. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, cheers. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll talk yeah, soon. Cheers. cheers. Right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you. All right. Cheers, everybody. Estrella Galicia is an independent family owned brewery in Northwest Spain, founded in 1906. Estrella Galicia Cerveza Especial is a world class lager brewed using the finest Spanish malts, locally cultivated Galician hops, and the best brewing practices made out of the state of the art facility in Acruña. Recognized around the world for quality and exceptional character, Estrella Galicia is a beer like no other. To learn more about Estrella Galicia, follow them at Estrella Galicia USA on Instagram. All About Beer is back, and we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Malt Europe Malting Company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at customer success at MaltEurope.com or dial 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Bob Kuntz has been having fun with beer since 2001. Bob opened Highland Park Brewery in Los Angeles in 2014 with the team at HPB. Bob has taken an adventurous approach to building a thoughtful community and exploring beer. With innovation and drinking beer in the LA sunshine in mind, the team at HPB experiments with unique processes, lots of hops, local ingredients, and of course, making lager beer. When not crushing a West Coast pills at HPB, Bob digs into the finer details of gardening, fermentation, and optimizing sleep. Welcome to the show, Bob. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. So I have to I have to ask because we don't I live in hazy land and we do not have these yet uh, where I come from in New England. Um, what the hell is a West Coast Pilsner? Because <laughs> to, <me, laughs> to me, it's like some words. Uh, I know th- I know what those words are. I just don't I don't understand. And I want to ask you, like, what what am I looking for? What What is it? As it relates to Highland Park Brewery. It is a very hop forward beer that maybe has some of the drinkability leaning of a Pilsner. Um, yeah, I think that I love hops. I'm, you know, always drinking hoppy beer, but I just want something that's a little more drinkable. Um, and so we've kind of landed in this, this sort of like mashup of a West Coast IPA and a, say, German Pilsner. Um, but I think for us, it probably leans a little bit more. IPA or West Coast IPA. But isn't that just a cold IPA? And what would, is there a difference between the West Coast Pilsner and the cold IPA? 
or am I missing something? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the goal for me as we, you know, maybe designate a style to one of our beers is to just communicate to our consumers what they're, they have coming in store. If people want to call it a cold IPA, I'm totally cool with that. Um, I see cold IPAs as higher, a little higher ABV, mm. brewed with lager yeast. I mean, ours typically are like five and a half to 5.8% ABV. Uh, I don't get too hung up on what it's called. For me, it's just about trying to communicate to consumers or to other brewers, you know, when they see it up on the board. And these beers kind of sit in a unique world. Um, so cold IPA, West Coast Pilsner. Um, I do see them a little bit of a weight difference. And I think cold IPAs are more IPA-like with ABV. And they are less focused on drinkability and like, being able to session multiple in at a time. Yeah, I don't. I don't mean to come in hot. <laughs> I, <laughs> come in hot. I was, come in I was hot. realizing. I was like, wow, I came in real hot there. Um, I it, this is from me coming as like an advanced cicerone and uh, like someone who's very like BJCP, which I'm don't need to be, and a lot, but a lot of people are. So, what do you say to people that are like? that's just an Italian Pilsner. Isn't that just an IPL? Isn't that just a cold IPA? Like, how do you kind of deal? Do you get any blowback from people who are like, the hell is this? Um, <laughs> I or, just, yeah, I, I, I just came off of uh, judging GABF about 18 hours ago. And I answered oh, wow. this question about three or four times from other judges that were like, what's a West coast Pilsner? How, <laughs> like, what do you enter that in? And I'm like, well, um, for us, we've meddled a couple of times in IPL. So it oh, sits yeah. in that category um, if we're going to enter it into a competition. Uh, but it sits on, I would say, the lower end of ABV. So that's why I, you know, don't quite say, I mean, IPL never really fit these beers. And, you know, we started making this beer, Timbo, uh, over seven years ago and the style didn't exist and we designated it west coast pilsner because we didn't know what to you know call this beer that was a genuine just mashup of a pilsner we had in tank a west coast ipa we had in tank and we blended a 50 50 cask and conditioned that cask and that was like the birth of the beer so you know it it I, I go back. To, I don't get too hung up on styles. It's just to communicate to consumers what they have in store. Uh, sometimes that's difficult when you have your own sensibility and you're trying to, you know, reflect, you know, a, a geography or a climate or whatever. Okay. So um, to that very point, as a consumer, when you say the words Pilsner, I guess I, I have something comes to mind and West Coast, something comes to mind, which is exactly your point, I think. So can you tell us then about how you make it? Like when I think of Pilsner, I think of, you know, a single malt, a very light malt. Um, but can you tell us about the grist and hops and, you know, mash schedule, that that sort of technical stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for us, we have always thought about this beer as Pilsner on the hot side of things. So uh we you know essentially are doing a base of environment floor malted boat pills and a raw oh. two row um and then we're using either noble leaning or american grown sort of like noble ish hops on the hot side um and uh a big part of what we're trying to develop in the base of the beer is maybe a fairly well attenuated beer that still has body and structure to hold on, on to hops that are going to get added on the cold side. So I often look at this beer as almost split on the two sides. It's the hot side, it's more Pilsner-like. Um, and if we were to not dry hop it, that it could maybe be a more robust Pilsner. Um, but we do a lot on that like body structure, yeast management, to build this base so that we can then dry hop it essentially identical to our West coast IPAs. So we dry hop the same rate as our West coast IPAs. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to find that balance so that there's enough body to support all of those hops. Uh, but yeah, 
it's it's a uh, we we kind of split it split it in half looking at it hot side more pilsner and the cold side dry hopping more ipa like so if if you were to not dry hop it and serve it would i th- would i be drinking a pilsner would it taste like a pilsner it would probably drink more like a bohemian pilsner yeah okay. a little more weight a little more weight a little more structure um and maybe you know a little bit less of that like delicate floral that german in the hops has and maybe just a little more yeah weighty uh, okay. but i th- i think it would i think it would we act- actually that's a good a good question like, we should we should try that we haven't ever done it <laughs> I like to ruin everybody's plans and make them do things that they no, you're helping them, Don. <laughs> Innovating. <laughs> yes. I would like to know how you came up with the idea for this and 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 the thought process of okay, I'm going to make a, you know, on hot side um a Pilsner style beer and then on the cold side dry hop it. Like, do you wake up at there's the story about how um John Lennon uh wrote the song or was it John Lennon or part? Anyway, one of the Beatles wrote wrote uh, a song in their sleep. They woke up and the the song was fully formed. Did, did the same thing like happen to you with this beer, or where does this come from? Uh, I mean, kind of two answers here. I don't think any of our beers are fully formed. We're in a constant sort of evolution forward to improve and tinker that with. You know, ingredients are constantly improving. Equipment is constantly improving. So. Uh, I would say for us and say specifically Timbo Pills, it's pretty close to its original iteration, but it is hopefully much better because we've had, you know, six or seven years to continue to tinker to improve it. Uh, now to like, where did Timbo come from? Well, kind of awesome. We, a uh, brewer who brewed with us for about three years, Tim McDonald, um, the beer's named after him. So shout out to Tim. Um <clears throat> He and I were, we had a cask to fill um, for a festival and we just had a sort of off the cuff idea to uh, split a Pilsner and a West Coast IPA in the cask 50-50. Uh, the, the cask was awesome. Um, it went over well at the festival, but even more so, we, we loved it. And it was immediately this sort of like prompt of like, okay, we need to do that in a beer. Um, and so from the get go, it was kind of this idea that we were going to do, uh, a more Pilsner like base, maybe leaning towards, uh, you know, European malts and noble leaning hops on the cold side and then focus on the like, well, like good late dry hop addition execution on the cold side. Um, so we, yeah. I was probably, I don't know, it's got to be 2016, maybe 15, that we first brewed that beer. Um, and it was very simplistic, inspired by that cask. Um, and kind of off to the races. I mean, we brewed that beer probably three or four years before it started to pick up some momentum. Um, and now, like for us, it's our number one selling beer in our tap room. Uh, oh, wow. And it definitely has the most momentum for us as a brewery. Uh, whenever, you know, I talk to someone in a conversation and meet them for the first time and they're in the beer world timbo is usually the, the beer that comes up um so that's pretty 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 fun i think maybe maybe it's novel because it's new and they haven't heard of you know they're confused by west coast pilsner um uh I, which i understand i think it is kind of a confusing term but we just never had a better term for it that was actually oh, yeah. my, my next question, because I was going to ask, like, the public, if I'm a casual drinker, and this is a sore spot for me, personally, as a beer person, because, like, what is West Coast that doesn't describe what I'm drinking? Same thing with, like, New England. Like, I know it's a place, but, like, why is this beer hazy? And so, do you do anything in your tap room, or if you distro it, to kind of educate people what like a West Coast, so what are they expecting? What should they expect? Uh, well, to sort of like maybe uh, throw an argument out there, a lot of the styles that we know are specific to a location. I already mentioned Bohemian Pilsner. Um, that is a location that immediately makes you think about that beer. 
even though you're saying a geographic lo location. Um, and so I think at this point in time in beer, if you say West Coast, you could probably not even have to follow up with IPA and people will, it's a big enough prompt that it designates some sort of leaning towards a style. Um, so that would be my argument is that uh, West Coast is so defined at this point that you can put it in front of Pilsner and it gives you an indication. And most beer drinkers would know what they're going to, they have in store for them. And you're also, um, yeah, on the West Coast. So you have the geography of being there. Technically, everything he does is West Coast. I'm just kidding. Uh, we actually make a lot of hazy beer. Um, but I would say we're more known for our West Coast. But I think that a lot of styles and style designation uh, comes from saying the region. You say like, oh, a Northern German pills or a Mexican lager or a, you know, you can go down the list. And you usually get some indication based on geographic designation. Uh, so that's my argument. No, for, no, that's a very, uh, calling, that's it, a, yeah. calling it West Coast. It's just a newer mm -hmm. style, but you know, probably in 20 years, that will be even more entrenched in the like, you know, beer collective conscience that it will probably mean even more, like, you know, be more recognizable. Um, it's just a newer style designation it's a very good point you bring up um which is yeah it's that is a good point because i don't know i'm i'm in that yeah because i wasn't there in 1842 when the czech pilsner was or the bow pilsner <laughs> or whatever was invented and i'm sure it went somewhere and everyone's like the hell is this <laughs> you know? well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i like the munich dunkel and that's all i'm gonna drink and this newfangled like golden beer isn't gonna suss this is a flash in the pan and then you know now it's a global phenomenon so who knows there, there yeah, was a time when, when beer didn't have hops in it no it's style and styles yeah. evolve as well i mean yeah for sure yeah. That, i'm a big fan of evolutionary push and new styles so i think it's really nice that you you guys are or you you brewed it. You're doing an evolution essentially yourself. You seven years ago brewed this beer, and then now it's kind of becoming. It has a style. It has a name. So yeah, and you know, will that hold? I don't know. I do. I mean, to sort of like argue against myself, I do think it's confusing for consumers. <laughs> you know, it's like it's our number one selling beer in our tap room, and sometimes we'll go to sell it to an account like a, a restaurant that's not quite as familiar with like craft beer and new styles. And it's very difficult to both sell it to them and for them to put it on their menu because maybe they have four beers on their menu and they want to have a Pilsner and a West Coast IPA and a Brown Ale, but then they put a West Coast Pilsner and it just confuses their customers. So I, you know, point is well taken because I go through that challenge. Um, I just think we're at the early stages of maybe what is, becoming a more defined style evolution and maybe in 10 years it won't be confusing for consumers because that style has picked up enough momentum we're gonna be drinking um, but maybe it won't. Beer. you know we're like mars <laughs> ale or i don't i don't know that alien brew or i don't know i mean do you like actually i guess my my question is where do you see this style going in 10 years since we are talking about evolution evolution yeah yeah um, I think that whether it's called the West Coast Pilsner or whether it's called something else, I can see, I can continue to see consumers. I see like, you know, tastemakers, whether it be like brewers or people in the industry, uh, really adopt this style because it's lower ABV and it's very hop forward. Um, I also think lager yeast is works very well with a lot of the new school tropical hops it's you know lager yeast has some sulfurs and creates these like tropical files passion fruits and guava and mango um that work great with hops um so you end up getting a more modern hop expression so i see whether it's called west coast pilsner or not i see that there is potential in this style um just because i think consumers lean more and more like tropical and fruity in their taste preference they like that freshness and i think there's potential there's a lot of potential with this style or whatever you want to call it um 
West Coast Pilsner. So I maybe I'm hopeful because it's what we we brew and what we like to brew. Um, but at, at this point, we just keep riffing on that style, and our consumers are so accepting of it. Um, they love it, uh, and so I, I think it has momentum. It, it seems like at least here in Los Angeles, it's it's you know Southern California. It's hot all the time. I'm just seeing more and more people uh, wanting to like drink beers in a more sessionable fashion rather than the high ABV. I don't know if that's an audience that we've curated, um, but I see momentum for us in that direction. Uh, so uh, I'm, I, I like that a lot and I'm hopeful it continues over the next 10 years. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you, you kind of mentioned earlier on that, that you sort of um, like you don't feel hampered by style, but do you actually actively eschew styles? Like, do you actively say, well, no, I'm not going to brew uh, New England IPA. I'm going to make my own kind of new thing. Do you actively try and do new things or? How do you think about uh, overall beer? I don't really beer. like to be a contrarian for contrarian's sake. Okay. <laughs> I would rather be driven by like pure curiosity into like flavor exploration. Um, sometimes you need a foundation to start from. So it's really nice when you have like a style parameter to then like get to understand and know. And then from there, you can kind of like riff and get more curious and, and venture out from there. Like, wow, well, what if you did this? Or like, oh, what if you, we have this little technique for our wit beer, but we can apply it to our, you know, hazy IPA um, and it worked. Um, mm -hmm. So it's good to have a foundation, I think, and to have some parameters. And then once you can kind of like get your handle on that, I think I like personally to adopt things for our own taste or for our consumers pace taste. it's always a conversation it's like I, I, if i was just doing it for my own taste i'd be just you know home brewing at home but i have you know <laughs> all our customers that we want to have a conversation with so it's often this like uh trying to make things that that we want to drink and our consumers want to drink sometimes they fit neatly into style sometimes they're little riffs and advancements, I don't know, advancements, but they're, you know, uh, push outside of those styles. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, Don, any other questions for Bob? Uh, no, but I did want to say that the song I was trying to think of earlier is Let It Be written by Paul McCartney, apparently in his sleep. Um, that's not, I'm not surprised. Yeah, not that they're related, <laughs> but as a Beatles fan, I'm not surprised. Um, Great. Um, if people want to learn more about your brewery or you, is there any like website, social media that you can uh, lead them to? Yeah, pretty, pretty straightforward. Websites, hbb.la, uh, Highland Park Brewery on Instagram and um, Facebook. Uh, we're in Chinatown in downtown Los Angeles. Um, everybody passes through Los Angeles at one point or another. We're pretty easy to find. We're right along the metro um, in the Chinatown stop in downtown LA. So hopefully we'll see you here. I'll share a pint with you. Cool. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on to talk about the evolution of beer and the West Coast Pilsner and how it came to be. And uh, it's really fascinating stuff. Really appreciate you have uh, coming on today. Ah, my pleasure. It's an honor to be on the show and talk about something I'm passionate about and love. So thanks for having cool. me. Of course. Cheers. Cheers, Bob. Cheers. So, Don, what'd you think? Um, Are you into the new lagers? Uh, uh, well, I haven't tasted one yet, but I am excited to taste one. Agree. Of, Me of too. each. Yes. And, um, and yeah, I like, uh, I, I, I'm really happy that we did this episode because I think a lot of people are cynical. Well, I'm cynical. Um, sure. And I so was, just I, hearing the thought process that there is mm, a thought, pro it's not just, yeah. shtick, it's not just, you know, some words, it's not just, oh, some customers words. like juicy. Oh, customers know like, yeah. like, oh, Pilsners are cool. People like Pilsners will just throw West coast in front of it and it'll make us money. You know, you like, know and I, I think if people are into music, for example, like, you know, hip hop 
got started as a blend of, you know, previous existing music styles. And, you know, if you're into, uh, well, in food, there's fusion restaurants that are blending mm-hmm. stuff. So it's all cool. I love it. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm into it. I think it's, it's very exciting. I'm excited about, I'm, yeah, I don't know when the West Coast Pilsner or the Juicy Lager trend will hit. I live, again, I live in hazy country. So maybe the Juicy Lager could find a place here in New England. Hint, hint to all the local breweries. Yes. Right? Hello. Hello, everyone. Listen, listen to what I'm saying and brew me a Juicy Lager. Um, we have cold IPA here now. Yeah, kind of. It. Yeah, uh, kind of. Um, but yeah, no, I love it. Um, so visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at All About Beer. And uh, if you're feeling generous, please visit our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. This is John Hall, the editor of All About Beer. And this episode of the All About Beer podcast is brought to you by Estrella Galicia. I'm once again joined by Xavier Cabello from the brewery. And earlier we were talking about lager brewing. But let's shift gears and talk about the present and future of alcohol-free beer. At Estrella Galicia, we are pioneers in the alcohol-free beer market. To be honest, we weren't the first ones in Spain, but almost. We started brewing alcohol-free beers in 1980, so we have more than 40 years of experience with these beers. We have changed our recipes and techniques a couple of times in these years. You always have to try to get the best beer experience for your customers. So we started with reverse osmosis techniques, but the result wasn't the best, and changed to vacuum distillation. More recently, we changed the recipe again in 2011, and launched our first Zero Zero beer. It is now based on a technique we call interrupted fermentation. In this technique, we have a wort that is rich in dextrins and ferments only for 12 hours. So when you taste our Zero Zero beer, you find a flavor intensity that other brands achieve with additives, aromas, sugars. It is an intensity that reminds you mainly of malt, grain and wort. In the US, by the way, it is only available the pale lager version, but in Spain we also brew an amber and a black zero zero lager. And there are plans for more developments. Thank you so much for that insight and for being a sponsor of this episode. For everybody listening, to learn more about Estrella Galicia, please go visit estrellagalicia.com. If you have questions for the experts, email us, podcast at allaboutbeer.com. That's also the email for feedback, suggestions, or to inquire about supporting the show through advertising. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Malt Europe Malting Company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at CustomerSuccess at MaltEurope.com or dial 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Uh, Don, where can people find out about what you do on the internets? Uh, I am at the Don of Beer on X threads and Instagram, and people can drop me an email at dawn at the dawn of beer dot com. And how about you, Em? I am at Pints and Panels across all social media, and my website is pintsandpanels dot com. This show is produced by All About Beer. Visit allaboutbeer dot com for articles, notes on this show and others, and to connect via the newsletter and social media. Cheers. Cheers. Drink in the innovation. Ha 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 ha.